on, on water issues, water policy. And I'll uh, so you, you let me know when you're uh, up and running. You're, you're on? Okay. So, uh, welcome. Um, please, if you have one of these things, please turn it off. We're, I'm going to try, and we're going to uh, stick to, we have one hour, but what I'd like to do is do about 30 minutes of the presentation, which gets us to G's and it terrible, and then about five minutes of possible pass forward, and then uh, questions. Uh, what my presentation really is inherently is about a 40, it's about a 50 minute, 60 minute presentation. So I'm going to kind of go through it quickly, and then um, we'll uh, you know, skip over it and, and hope that the least of people say tell me more about or something. Um, so this is, uh, um, we're going to try to get into the idea of an engineer. I like numbers and um, all that stuff. But, and we've got a lot of numbers. But the main thing is um, we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. And so a whole, I had the opportunity this morning to see the presentation by Elena, uh, I forget her last name, Ortiz, Ortiz. on, on the, the Native American situation and with respect to things. And it's so parallel to what we're doing here. So a lot of what we want to do is try to, uh, try to um, put us out of the Imperial Western Victor role and more in the role of the people whose uh, assets we're talking about. Um, we have to deal with things, that are rational. this is about a needs rational discourse, and all around us, if you have a system in place, the people who are involved in the status quo say, I don't want to hear about this. But as free people, we must not be afraid of pursuing a thought. We must not be afraid of logically examining things. So many times I'll be doing a talk with somebody, and physically or, visual, or mentally, you see, I don't like where this conversation is going because we're being challenged. Now, if we're being lied to, that's good, but we need to be open to the fact that we need to be able to listen. Uh, the truth shall make us free, but as uh, Sam Clement says, but first it'll be done. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, hope to get uh, through some discomfort. And um, yeah, there we go. So again, we, we don't really, we're invested in not hearing about this. And so, um, water, uh, this is, Water is something that's beyond stuff. It is the stuff of water. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, a thousand is 500 BC. Uh, water is the principle of all things. And God is the mind, and the shape and the of things. In other words, the water is so fundamental that Thales uses it to define God. Um, so now, now we're going to talk about some human rights, universal rights to water. Um, the Universal uh, United Nations uh, covenant: <coughs> all peoples may freely disclose their natural wealth and resources. Um, then, rights to water, human rights to water is indispensable prerequisite for the realization of the, the human rights. We have no human rights unless we have that. And how many of you even applies to Palestinians? The UN General Assembly reaffirms unalienable rights of the Palestinian people. In particular, it's a general principle, but even if it's even, even then uh, applied specifically in the Palestinian case. Uh, again, this is particularly to the Palestinian occupation <coughs> as recently as 20 years ago. Um, now, let us get into the issue of occupying power. That um, it's this. If you, especially after we, what happened in World War II, we see uh, lands being appropriated for, a, for the benefit of the, uh, the capture. But the, uh, this is going back to 1910, 1929, and uh, Israel is a signatory to this court in 1949. The, the blocks of the literate, the occupying power safeguard, the national. Who are you from? I'm not going to be able to hear him. He's not talking. He's my safeguard the natural resources and provide the original citizens they need from these resources. Yeah, you two people can walk here, yes. You can't lock the door. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll. Um, 
and the, again, the, and that's the universe that broadly applicable principle. We have the um, Helsinki rules, 1966, distribution of water, uh, UN General uh, Assembly is the next. So there's just this avalanche of precedent for, um, and again, a specific case to Palestine. And that should have access to the four main activists and the drug river. But however, it says 67, no drug river water has been extracted from Palestine. Uh, let's look, so that is general, a general principle. Let us back up, but this is not something new. This is the, the, what I had before, there's a 20th century uh, practice jurisprudence treaty. But if we go back 4,000 years ago, uh, the Babylonians had an advanced hydraulic society. They moved water from the mountains into the cities. And, it, and doing this in a way that uh, provided for the general good of the community, as well as protecting uh, you know, people from the careless use of the water. You know, if you have an irrigation ditch and it overflows and it damages your, somebody else's field, um, you are, you're held liable. This is uh, Hamurabi, 1700 BC. From Justinian's time, 580 AD, he put together this code, code of Justinian. His people, he had his people go back a thousand years in the classical age of Greece to a thousand years of what rules have been set in place for the distribution maintenance of water assets for the benefit of society. And this uh, the code of Justinian spread to the whole Roman Empire, England, the British Commonwealth, common law. Um, water <coughs> as a public trust. For, for the benefit of, of all the people. Uh, okay, now that is in the past. That is all we've talked about is entitlement of the resident people to their resources and assets. Ah, but welcome to the age of discovery. In the 1400s, we have uh, Henry the Navigator, for instance, of, of uh, Portugal, cruising down the west coast of Africa. And of course, if you find it, it's got to be yours. And so we had various popes, papal bulls of that time period issued uh, granting uh, authority of these discoverers to claim whatever. And if some Christian prince could claim some land uh, and pillage and plunder and take, and really it says to destroy, take, seize, and own all the property, tangible and intangible, and have it accrued to that Christian king. And so now, <coughs> then, uh, so this is, um, this is applicable first to Africa and as a Portuguese went around the horn to Asia. Now we have several uh, Christian kings saving the, the pagan from uh, being, having access to the resources. Now we have the Law of Nations, 18, 1490s, various folks decreeing that, well, if the Portuguese claim something, then it's theirs. In the Spanish, they can't claim that one. There's arm among thieves. They can't steal from each other. But stealing from the natives is OK, but they have to. So that's the, the law of nations in the late 1400s. Now, of course, we have the, the Colombian era, <coughs> 1492 and all. And again, more and more specifically applicable to the Western Hemisphere. Um, let's look at the United States, the Manifest Destiny, the Indian Wars. That it is obviously, uh, it's, it's obviously decreed that, um, that it, people as the Europeans on the East Coast uh, are entitled and authorized, in fact, mandated to uh, destroy the assets of the Indians to make them so they're no longer self-sufficient uh, and, and, and more amenable to being managed. In the 1880s, we had the scramble for Africa um, in, in this Berlin conference. Uh, about 14 European nations got together and said, okay, King Leopold, you get this, and the Germans get this, and so that was, that is the whole mindset, that ethos in the 19th century of, it was the, the Europeans are em, em, empowered and expected to take what they want. Now we have Palestine after the 1880s, again, what, from my perspective, if we were Palestinians, I would think, again, part of the, a, a European colonizing uh, experience. <coughs> um, geopolitics, that, that map there, <laughs> show, we show Turkey and the Caspian Sea and east of there. Um, the, the, this great game, the British and the, from 1810, 1910 kind of territory, the British 
and the Russians were jostling for power. The, the British had, the, the, had India, their crown, crown jewel from the early 1800s. Late 1800s, the British had Egypt. It was very important then to maintain a sphere of influence from Egypt to India. And a lot of this great game business at uh, this time period dealt with the, it making, keeping sure that Tsarist Russia could not approach India from the north through uh, Afghanistan and what we now call Pakistan. Um, and so, the, and also the British had a lower, very important in the eastern, in the Levant, the area, they, very, they wanted very much to limit French influence in the eastern Mediterranean. And the, uh, so that was a, that, the great game was uh, a bunch of proxy wars, a bunch of client states to, uh, to advance and protect the, the British uh, flank. So now <coughs> we've got into the world, going to World War I, we have 1915, the Hussein <coughs> correspondence, what we call the Arab deal. If you Arabs help us get rid of the Turks, you'll get uh, liberty. About the same time, the Sykes Foucault, the French deal, the, the French and the Brits agreed on how to divide up the spoils, carving up the Turkey, you might say. 1917, Balfour Declaration of the Jewish deal. We got Arab, French, Jewish. At this point, the Brits have, they're like somebody invited three girls to the prom, and they all said yes. I'm, I'm sounding trivial, but they, they committed to an unmaintainable system. Um, in 1922, the British managed to slink the League of Nations into putting the crown on the, U on the Brits to just receive this mandate of the, uh, the, the land between the Mediterranean <coughs> and the Jordan. Uh, this is a quarter century of this balancing act between uh, England trying to maintain some open uh, access to European to, uh, people emigrating from Europe and those of the, the Palestinians. Uh, after a quarter century of this, in 47, the UK hands the problem off to the UN. This partition plan, uh, which uh, we talked heard about this morning, we have this 1947-40 conflict. Miko Pellet did a wonderful job with this. We've got um, the establishment of the State of Israel on 78% of the mandate Palestine. Not that the UN had any right to allow, allow allocate it to 55% uh, to the, uh, the would-be Israeli state, but it was 978%. Now we've got 1967, Israel captures the so-called West Bank from Jordan and Gaza from Egypt. No, remember, there's no Palestine anymore. The Jordanians took some, the Egyptians took the uh, Israel has some. Next, okay, so now, let's, let's, here's a regional map. What's going on? From here, from the Mediterranean to the Jordan, we've got about 12 million people. Five or so from Palestine, two-thirds from West Bank, 1.7 or so from Gaza. Gaza, it, this, this, this Gaza Strip has the area of the city and county of Denver. And it is now forced to be self-sufficient, food, water, agriculture, everything. City and county of Denver size, getting close to 2 million people. Israel, 7 million people of whom about 20% are Palestinian and Arab, uh, not, not Jewish. But <coughs> here's the region, uh, Syria, Jordan, uh, Egypt, uh, Sinai. Uh, <coughs> regional peace proposals, going back, now remember, in 67, um, uh, <coughs> West Bank was captured by, um, by Israel. Uh, we're going to be pretty silent about Gaza. It, it is, such a much worse situation, but mostly talking about West Bank. Um, it, so four years after that war, Anwar Sadar of Egypt said, you know, we could, six years after the war, we could um, work this out. We can have a regional initiative, a regional reconciliation of all these claims, counterclaims, and go the buyers said, well, no. That would involve us giving up the territories we took, took in 67. That ain't gonna happen. So as early as that time, all these, uh, all these attempts to come up with regional fixes, non-combative regional fixes, uh, resolution of the problem, have been rejected by Israel. They, they, they don't acknowledge the receipt. 2002, the Arab League said, full regional political economic normalization. The Israelis never opened the mail. They're not going to, they don't want it. Uh, same, time, same thing here. Next, please. 
So now we have this, this peace process, my God, there's the Oslo Agreements, 1995 Declaration of Principles, uh, we'll see them more on a map, but the so-called PA, Palestinian Authority, uh, it gets to control 18% of the land. Joint control with Israelis, 21%, and the Israelis have full control, 61%. Doing the math here, we've got, this, this is, this has up to 39% of 22%. That's 9% of the mandate Palestine. Why did these so-called representatives of Palestine sign such a statement? I do not know. Well, I get suspicious. But that's the fact. Next, please. So here is the map. And, and this, the, the green are areas allegedly normally controlled by uh, the, uh, by the uh, joint joint control. Uh, nominal Palestinian control is Jericho, uh, Nablus, uh, Ramallah, uh, Bethlehem, pockets. That's 18%. That's the white is everything. Israel has Israel it, it got to control 61% of mandate Palestine, including the whole Jordan. There's in the whole Jordan Valley, no Palestinian can set foot except for a little bubble around <coughs> Jericho. Next place. Now, people can draw lines on maps and create bogus countries. Water is stupid. He wants to go down here. <laughs> and so these contrivances of what's Lebanon and what's Jordan and what's Israel slash Palestine, and in particular, the artificial partition within Israel Palestine, totally ignores natural uh, phenomena. But here is, the, here is the, the, west, the, the boundaries of the West Bank are they enough, pretty much coincide with the, the uh, most productive aquifer. Well, it's not, it's not surprising. It's about half my, it's a ridge, about 2,000 feet high above sea level. So not surprising that would be the recharge area of aquifers. So we've got uh, an eastern aquifer. This is the mountain aquifer. We've got one that flows east into the Jordan one that flows west into Israel, one that flows north <coughs> into, the, into the Galilee. And here, the, the, the Jordan River rises in, in uh, Lebanon and in, in, uh, Syria, and, and it's it intercepted by, to, the water comes out of the Jordan River, down here to, to Tel Aviv, and down here to Beersheba, as ways to irrigate the negative. In doing so, it dries up the Jordan. Well, Israel, remember, everybody needs water. So the, the Jordanians, the Israelis, everybody is taking out more water than uh, sustainable in, in, in the Jordan River. But this is a situation, the surface water bypasses Palestine, and the, the uh, now let's talk about the groundwater in the next slide, please. Now this is rainfall, the, the high, High ridge gets about 24 inches a year, which is a lot more than we get in Denver, and certainly here. And the lower areas, surprisingly enough, are not that much lower. Next, please. Now, here is the same, pretty much the same map that shows the, the uh, well, the rough aquifers. And this is going quickly, we'll get slow down as needed. But this is a political map, sort of, and this is the Israeli side, of the Israeli view of this. And I'm trying to, not, let us not, Good guy, bad guy things. Let's say we are Israeli water planners and we need to get water for our people. So here's a map of the resources in the West Bank. And this number one area is the most productive, uh, well, if you know, the most productive place to put, put around. And these are in between and these are very low. <coughs> and so, next place. Now these are numbers. This, uh, this is the Western aquifer. This is the split of what goes west, like the Tel Aviv and what sticks for the Palestinians. This is this uh, not northern aquifer, and uh, it mostly goes into Israel. There's the eastern one that goes toward uh, Jericho. Uh, the, this goes to Israeli settlements in the Jordan Valley, all of which are illegal. You know, this, this is West Bank land, but this is what it is. Now, it says, <coughs> Israeli planners consider this western aquifer vital to Israeli water needs, and therefore would like to retain control of the settlement blocks of that area. In other words, how do you control water? You put your houses on it so that you, you actually pump and use the water. 
It should be noted, and this to me is the most important thing. It should be noted that Israel's water supply always came from the American first. If we take out the word Israel and say regional water supply, because all these nations, <coughs> are, you know, the water just goes where it goes. Uh, it should be Israel's water supply always came from these aquifers, both during mandate times and when the land is known by Jordan. Next place. So um, now we get to, let's say now we're trying to deal with, we're Palestinians, trying to deal with supplying the Palestinian uh, system. Uh, they have no access to the Jordan River, mountain aquifers all. Uh, Israel limits the amount of water annually available to about 20% of the total. Israel over extracts water far in excess of the sustainable yields. And uh, next please. Uh, here are some numbers. Uh, an Israeli Ministry of Environmental Protection says the sustainable yield is about 360 million cubic meters a year. And then some various numbers about how much is actually taken out. <coughs> that's one number, and that's one number as of 20, 20 something years ago. But whatever it is, don't worry about the subtraction. Whatever it is, this is some bunch of water in excess of the sustainable yield. And it's some numbers in excess of the also agreement allocation. So how could this happen? I mean, what, but you know, to the answer is this, there's a non-symmetrical power balance. The United States, backed by the US, establishes facts on the ground, and the Palestinians adapt as best they can. And what do we mean? Now, Jeff Halper speaks superbly and he, 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 I think he's credited with this phrase, matrix of control, where it was full spectrum dominance. Um, the Israeli system regulates, restricts every ability to move, transport, import, export, transport, move goods, services within West Bank and out, you know, try to get goods in or out. Uh, your ability to get to your farmland, your schools, anything is all, all controlled by the state. This map is much too busy. But again, it says area A, B, C. And, but again, I, I leave it up because it shows that within, and, and this is the area they call West Bank, within, within most of it is Israeli control. And these maroon, these little shady things are major concentrations of Israeli uh, populations in Palestinian lands. Um, 1967 war. Immediately after this war, which, uh, you know, how are you? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, I'll take Miko Pellet's conversation this morning um, as being pretty authoritative. Immediately afterward, Israel put in, sent in control of the water resources. The, the big, thick book of regulations appeared in no time. All Palestinian water resources are Israeli state property. Early, we talked about the power, the responsibility of the occupying power to protect, preserve, maintain, and support the indigenous people with their water. They, not just water resources, but we're talking about water here. Israeli military commanders, not even a, a civilian government, it's military commanders have authority over the water resource in the West Bank. If you're a Palestinian, you can't develop water, you can't maintain, construct any kind of water resource, tank, holder, cistern, anything without a permit. Well, try and get the permit. <coughs> so they're, they're, again, now we're at 67 to 93 time period, more the same, uh, completely compu uh, prohibited from accessing uh, Jordan surface water. In 82, Sharon transfers the whole mess to whole, all the resources to the Israeli water company, Mekarat. So it is now operated as, as if it's a private water, util water utility but the enforcer is Israeli Defense Forces. Now, 93 to 95, now we get to this Oslo Agreement, horrible, horrible thing. Now, it's an interim agreement in 1995, which is supposed to last for five years. It's, it's a temporary arrangement. Everything's postponed until permanent status is agreed, which is supposed to be in the year 2000. 2000's come and gone. But the impositions are not. And thanks. But let me back up one, one Thank you so much. Until it, but the Israeli positions, until it's all agreed, nothing's agreed. And so it was a temporary interim thing. That the, so the area C, which is 61% of the West Bank, was placed under complete Israeli control for an 18 month period, just to see how long it would work. Well, 18 years later, 
it ain't working so good if you're Palestinian. So the whole, any water infrastructure in the area requires a permit. Uh, permits can take about, this something like 18 layers of committees and referrals and whatever it is. To, and a dozen years is good time for, to actually get a permit for anything. For those favored uh, situations that get a permit. And let's go back, this, here's this map again. Um, that the, the blue, the green are joint areas of administration. The, the orange are very little little pockets, like Ramallah. I've lived in Ramallah sometimes. Ramallah's pretty comfortable. It's where the NGO money goes. It's pretty nice. My son Eric's visiting me there. Um, it's not in reality. I mean, it's it's a little bubble, but most of it, this white area, it's all controlled by the Israelis. And uh, if you're a Palestinian, you're, you're very limited opportunities to do anything. Now, area C, not, this is it's sparsely populated by Palestinians. And the program, the result of all these programs is that they get more and more sparsely populated by the Palestinians in area C. It, it prevents uh, the full control. It's, it prevents development of water resources. So the farmers have to do what they can to capture water in systems, little tanks, which the Israeli, the Israeli Defense Force will routinely destroy because it's, it's not authorized to do that. You're stealing water. <clears throat> so a, a joint water committee was established <coughs> Uh, to, to deal with water and sewage related issues uh, whereby the Palestinians get a seat at the table to be told you can't do it until you do this and so In the absence, in the continuation of asymmetrical relationships, for some reason a parallel, a mirror of that was not established wherein the Palestinians <coughs> have to sit in judgment of determining which Israeli projects go forward. For, for some reason it's not not quite symmetrical. You know, some of the uh, people are more equal than others. <coughs> uh, uh, next, please. So now, again, and I'm skipping things because I'm watching the clock. Israel continues to uh, exert control up till now. Um, Roadblocks restrict the next. Um, and then the, this joint water committee is dressing up domination to look like cooperation. I've talked about the delays. If you finally get an approved, you get projects approved, then you need a building permit from the Israeli Civil Administration. So most of the time, that doesn't happen. So it, it is, uh, it, it's, um, for some reason, I, you don't quite know why people sign this thing. Now, what's it all after? Here's what it means. It means we've seen some maps that, that show this edge of this West Bank area is the most productive well field. It's where most of the water flows. And it's near where the major population that is Tel Aviv. It's near where the Israelis need a lot of water. Everybody needs a lot of water. But these, these marks here are, indicate, the, the length of the mark indicates how deep the well is. On the Palestinian side, we see shallow wells. And on the Israeli side, we see deep ones. It's not because the Palestinians don't know that the deeper you drill, they are limited. The Palestinians are limited to 130, 140 meters uh, for well drilling, but the, we don't see this limitation on the Israeli side. So Israelis can keep, keep drilling into wherever it takes to get to the water. So th these, this map shows this area here. Um, this this shows this area here. But the main thing is you can see again some people are more equal than others and get to drill to where the water is, not where the permit says. Now um, next. Um, as if that's not bad enough, comes to know the wall. In 2002, I was working in Bethlehem as in that area at that time and saw the beginning of this wall in 2002, but again 2003, when they really started stringing concertino wire and making it from a line on a map. Um, it's a conversion of administrative areas into physical <coughs> areas. Again, here's kind of the same, I can show the same map again, but this is. You can't see this, <laughs> but there's some light blue areas here, which are the most productive areas. And this so-called separation wall, oddly enough, frequently in, goes into Palestinian areas, it's called Helium, into Palestinian areas to make sure that the, the village is left high and dry, and the wall goes in, and, and so the, the lands that the for, people used to work are on the other side of the wall, or fence, and the well fields on the other side. 
and so it's a way to dry up the villages from separate them from their assets so they go away. Uh, this is uh, this is the same thing, a little detail. You can see perhaps the blue here is where the productive volatiles are. More detail. Um, this, the, this, the green line here is the, what could be what the international world says is the national is the what would be the effect. These are Cochilia and Zulkarm are particularly affected by the well, the, the, the wall intercepting their water. They're losing about another 18 percent of their what, what they had before the wall. So summary uh, of the total water sources. Israel controls about 89 percent. And again, the population of Israel and Palestine are about even, six, seven million, about even. Um, groundwater, 83 percent. Surface water, 90 percent. Uh, well, they control 90 percent. They use all the the after Syria and Lebanon and Jordan. Runoff water is 90 percent because the Palestinians aren't allowed to capture the water running off because they're stealing, stealing water. Um, agriculture. The Palestinians don't do much agriculture, water irrigated agriculture, because they don't have much water. Um, the water used by the settlers, Israeli settlers, consume six times what the Palestinians do per capita. And uh, while the Israelis in Israel proper consume three times what the Palestinians do. So the Israeli settlers are twice as use, use twice as much water per capita as the uh, Israelis in, in, uh, in uh, being part of the country. Um, next. Household consumption, well, the numbers are low. <coughs> next. Um, now, to boost inefficient supplies, Palestinians must buy water from Israel, like 50 million cubic meters a year. This is the water that Israel's taken from the Mount Aquifer, in which the Palestinians should be, it's their own water, they should be able to use it, but it's been taken, but you can buy back some of the positive cash flow for Israel. Next, use of occupied Palestinian territory resources by Israel. Lots of settlements are planted on Palestinian lands. There are tax, air economic incentives, tax deductions. The Israeli government subsidizes your factory if you establish it in, in, in West Bank uh, Palestinian territory. So there's lots of stuff made in Israel that's really made in illegal settlements. Like the soda stream product you may see in stores. That's not only is made in Israel, but it's made on Palestinian land using Palestinian resources and assets. Uh, Dead Sea Minerals with Ahava Cosmetics, Gold Mine. Uh, this wine from grapes in West Bank and Milan that are mislabeled. The, this limestone quarries, the Israeli government the mining companies, take my limestone from, you cut limestone to, you know, this block, or make cement from this metal out of it. And it's taken from the Palestinian hands. And, and convert it to uh, products. Uh, another part is the cap captive economy. By constraining Palestinian manufacturers to be self-sufficient, um, they have to buy Israeli products. Uh, case in point, Thai Bay beer. I, I keep using beer and wine as examples. Right? It's that, mm -hmm. probably a character of wine. <laughs> but Thai Bay beer, they, they make good beer. But on, out of solidarity, they don't want to buy bottles from Israel. They buy bottles from Portugal. And they go through hell getting stuff through customs. And the Israelis say, hey, buy from us. No problem. Um, and then distribution of other products such as beer. There, there's, a pretty, there's, there's a wine uh, vineyard uh, in, in the Bethlehem area um, that cannot be distributed anywhere. You, know, you can get Israeli wine in Palestine, but it's, it's hard to move it 30 miles to Palestinian made stuff. Uh, pharmaceuticals, particularly, is disadvantageous. I know people have worked in uh, uh, biochemists uh, working in, in the Berzait Albire, pharmaceuticals. And you know, they, they face subsidized competition from Israeli multinationals who they can bring stuff from all over the world and dump it in, in Palestine and, and with a captive market by cutting out the Palestinian producers. And so the Palestinians pay more for generic drugs than most other people, because it's the only game in town. Not, not poor guys. Briefly, we've got one and a half million people in a space, as I say, the size of the city and county of Denver. Uh, this 
Israel has a couple of choices of African prisons, but it's the only one that Gaza has. Uh, they're about 55 million cubic meters a year short of sustainable yield. Uh, they've long resorted to overextraction, pumping as much as 100 cubic meters, 100 million cubic meters a year. The result has been a marked progressive deterioration of quality of water. The best thing you can say about water in Gaza, the last job I had before I retired was I was in living in Ramallah running a water pipeline project in the Gaza Strip. It was 2006. <coughs> I never, have not been there, but that was a political thing. Um, but the best thing you can say about the water, groundwater there is it's saline from seawater intrusion for over pumping. But it's also contaminated by sewage, by, I think that's good, by um, herbicide, pesticide, fertilizer, whatever. You know, you just can't cram a bunch of people into a little space with no way to do it right. This is the last thing I have on Gaza, the Gaza gas field. <clears throat> Off of the coast of Gaza, we have a whole bunch of gas, gas fields of an estimated 1.4 trillion cubic feet as uh, 10 years ago, it's about $4 billion. If the Israelis would let the Gaza people you let Palestine have access to its stuff. Gaza could be self-sufficient for energy, produce enough natural gas to feed, to make generate enough, enough electricity, to run desalination plants, to have irrigated agriculture, to export electricity as a revenue stream. Gaza would not be a broken hand basket case. Gaza could be self-sufficient, export excess power to Western. The problems are not physical, they're political. And, and the remedies are in front of us, but we'd rather support systems that, that bomb and kill. Uh, I, would, I worked in Ramallah for this company, British Gas. I worked for another company that was, was parent, had, had a common parent with British Gas. And they were, I had, go up the stairs, there's a picture of Yasser Arafat on this, oil, this gas rig, this big flare, and he's smiling over there. So. But that was, you know, it, it really is there, and it really could be captured if only our political, political system would allow it to happen. Um, they, they, in, in 2007, 2006, Israel wanted to go around the, uh, the Palestinians just deal with British gas. British gas withdrew from negotiations, and it's late into, into late 2000, in, into 2008, there's still negotiation with the Israelis. The Israelis want to have that deal done before they started bombing Gaza. And they just, you know, they wanted to, you know, that's in the next place. Okay, so now what? <clears throat> that is, that's the, geez, ain't it terrible part. What do we do now? I don't have a bright, smiley face thing, but let's look at options. Number one is the status quo, the death by a thousand cuts of Palestine, the, in, the, the Indian reservation option. This area C is being annexed into Israel. It's happening right now. Because the Israelis have got this Levi, Levi report that says, we're not, you know, we're not occupation, it's part, it's our place. So, so this 61% area C is being seen as Israel proper, and that's happening. Uh, and then what would happen is the Palestine Authority would be allowed to administer areas A and B, and what is that? That's, that's not right. Again, we got Indian Reservation. That's where we're, that's, that's what our government and the Israeli government are pushing for this, this, this pious nonsense about two states living side by side, which is, it's not possible. I mean, you've got half a million Israelis on the Palestinian side. They're, they're not going to go away. Eh? So, so the, the, the status, this is where we're headed. The annihilation, the nibbly, nibbly <coughs> death, day by day by day of, of a Palestinian state. And how many Palestinians really believe this two-state thing? Hardly anybody. No, but this, you know, there's no credibility to this two-state thing. The alleged leaders of the United States, Israel, and Palestine keep pretending that's a possibility, but that's the people don't believe it anymore. <clears throat> the one state, unitary from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean, is nearly inevitable. Um, Nico Pellet said it. This, like it or not. That's the only possibility. And tens of thousands of people are going to suffer. Tens of billions of dollars are going to be spent killing, bombing. And you talk to the average Palestinian and say, you know, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, it'll be over, don't worry. You know, this, this is inevitable now. As uh, 
in 671, when the various Arab states started saying, let's work this out, let's, let's politically resolve this, at that time it was possible. At that time there was a West Bank with some territorial contiguity. And it would have been possible in 1970. In 2010, it's not possible anymore. Um, one possibility is the Palestinian Authority dissolves itself. If they are honorable, when I moved there in 2006, said if these were honorable men, they are all, almost all men, um, they would say, I'm not going to put up with the charade anymore. I'm not going to be part of this Vichy government that uh, pretends to oppose Israel, but is actually the, the peace, the, actually the enforcer for Israel, Israeli dominance. So the only possibility is, this is, and you heard it here, but don't worry about it, is, you know, why, the, the, if they had any, any respect, self-respect, they dissolve themselves, give up their uh, Mercedes, give up their fancy houses, uh, stop, and the PA stops being the outsourced administrator for the benefit of Israel, remove the charade of self-governance, and remove Israel's ability to pretend that the Geneva cards do not appeal. And Israel will then be bound by the rules of the occupying power, as an occupying power. So there is, there, there is a, a choice, the, the political, political possibilities. This one is what the powers that be really want. The Americans, if it's Barack Obama or Romney, or it doesn't matter. The, the people in power in the US just want to pretend this to the two-state option, and their silence is allowing this to happen. Um, again, the one state I think is inevitable, and having these people behave like honorable persons. People don't walk away from honor. Next place. The technical answer is draw a bigger box. Water is stupid. It doesn't know where the boundaries are. And, and, and to end the zero-sum allocation of an ina inadequate water supply between two water short adversaries, Israel and Palestine, between them, don't have enough water. Now, to fight over that last shred, politically, it, you know, it's appealing to somebody, but there's not enough water to be worth uh, fussing about. There's a graphic, of, don't, don't go yet, but I've got a graphic on the next page. Turkey, Lebanon, Iraq, and Syria do have surplus water assets. You need political will and money, but it's there. It's there. And you know, for decades, there have been proposals for regional moralizations of national relationships but until Israel and its neighbors agree to relate to each other, the remedy will elude us. That somehow, looking at regional water assets, no, this is a this this was a crummy graphic when I started it and blowing it up with this fuzzy thing. But it shows that Israel and Jordan between them, and I'll say Israel, Palestine, and Jordan, if these three people fight over the water they don't have, what's the point? It's not a gaining issue. I'm sorry if you're <laughs> the, the no water people are down here where you can't see it. Up here where you can see it is where the water is, so if you're missing it. But over here we have Iraq does have surplus water. This is a 15-year-old chart. Turkey has surplus water. Egypt has a lot of water, but mm, it's no surplus. Uh, poor Lebanon could just barely get by. Syria has a little surplus, but it's in the wrong places. And um, But with the political... Again, it's not a it's not a technical problem. Next place. This I found this wonderful article, um, but this this gentleman who is an Israeli uh, is 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 a, a staunch Israeli Zionist, and um, but you know he but he says not coming from the point of view of any I'm sorry for being rude what I ever do, but coming from the point of view of. This, the water is a parable for the problems of the Middle East conflicts. It's a political problem. It's, if it, it, like, this is so powerful. If there is a water war, it will not be water that caused the war, but rather a war that was in search of an issue and found water. So again, it's technically, there is something possible. Technical solutions exist if only our hearts would accept them. This is a gentleman who died last year, Ami Isarov, the Rebel um, here in the, 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 the fast forward, I, I took about 10 more minutes than I thought I would. But so, so please, uh, questions, uh, we can go back on to things or the, the other issues. Uh, could I ask the lady in the back?
Well, could you say something about the percentage of water you, you mentioned used in agriculture? And so is Israel exporting its water in the form of agricultural products? And how does it contrast with <coughs> other forms of agriculture? And that, that seems in, you know, we're, insofar as we're doing demand management, we tend to do transfers here in the West from agricultural water to municipal water uses. Well, what, is, what are the Well, policies? yeah, it's not, it, it, it is trying to grow tomatoes in the negative. <laughs> you can do it. Cotton, oranges. Well, there's no, I mean, you can, but it's a question of would you rather buy oranges from someplace that where they want to grow naturally and just pay the money for the freight? Or would you rather use water as a weapon to dry up your neighbor to, to consume it for agriculture? Yeah, so, so they, <coughs> Israel is, is wants to be self-sufficient for in agriculture. It's um, it's a good place for drying laundry. It's not a great it's not a great place for uh, you know for water hungry plants. But but you can do it. Welcome to New Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It, so uh, yeah, I don't know if I've really answered your question, but yeah, the answer is yes. That Israel does. Export its water could create agricultural products for internal use. So you know, I mean, for any state or nation to be as self-sufficient as possible makes a lot of sense. You know, why take your hard currency and buy stuff from somebody else if you can make it grow? That that makes a lot of sense. So yeah, that's happening. Plus, if you can steal it from the Palestinians, so it offers you. Well, it's another thing. Okay, it's a stand. Two questions, you may not have time to get to either of them, but um, if there was someone from the Israeli <coughs> water office standing here uh, talking about the distribution of water, what would he or she be saying that was different, that would be different from what you're saying? Well, I think the facts are not, I mean, you know, I've tried to, obviously, I've you know, colored this with some value. Uh, Stan asked, uh, let's say we had somebody from the Israeli uh, Mekarov, the, the water utility, and to what kind of rebuttal would they have to this? Um, I think it would be along the lines, I showed a couple of slides, it says, here's where the water is. My assignment as a, a master planner for Mekarov, my assignment is to use these resources as best I can to uh, re serve the needs of my constituency. So I think, you know, the numbers are there, mostly came from Israeli sources. So I think the question would be, you know, I, I'd obviously call it with some value judgments about this ain't right, kind of thing. But I think I think the facts, and I think I think these numbers are internationally used, used numbers, and a lot of them from Israeli sources. But you had a second. Yeah. Um, in terms of the history of all this, prior to the mandate, what was customary use of water, and how were water disputes adjudicated? Sure. And and Stan asked uh, about uh, customary use. You know, before in 1922 was the start of the British mandate. But up to that, we had half a millennium of Ottoman rule. And so Stan is asking, well, what were the systems of distribution and allocation under Ottoman rule? And um, I, 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 as you pointed out, I'd like to talk to you more about water rights and the history thereof. But, um, but clearly, but what it was, it was, uh, it, there was, you know, agriculture was not very intense. It was, what you, you grew water, you grew where the water fell. And so in, in that, in the Ottoman period, there was very little uh, irrigated agriculture. And so the, the flows in the Jordan River were very high. You look at photos of the Jordan River in 1900, 1910, it was, it was a serious river. So and when, I was, when did irrigation really start then? I'd say, I'd say the irrigation started in the water here in, in the mandate period. And really after 1948, when, when the Israeli uh, as an Israeli nation could, could have the name Israel. But from the 1920s on, um, and you asked about the history of irrigation, from the 1920s on, <coughs> well, even before that, European immigration really started in the 1880s, uh, 1910, but after World War I, it was stronger. So the 1920s were really the first time of serious presence in, in large numbers of, of European immigrants, the European Jews, uh, who came, came over there with, with idealism of a, a, a communal 
communist kind of a, an environment where hard work could turn low grade soil into something for the community. A lot of uh, left, left, leftish, you know, uh, socialist, Marxist uh, idealism about building a community in a place that was safe, not being a Jew in Israel in, in Europe was not a good thing for a very long time. So this is a place to be safe and, and, and build a community and grow. So in the 1920s on, we start to see more mechanized, more intense agriculture. And more competition for scarce resources. More competition, but really 1948, but again on the issue of the Jordan River, if, that, if you want to, I want to use Jordan River flow as an inverse indicator of, uh, of technology. In the low tech rate regime, a hundred years ago, the Jordan River was wide and deep and fast. I've been to the, the baptismal site in 2006, uh, and it was it was a trickle. And this it's wide in this room, but it, it, it was a trickle, and it's just green slime and uh, hardly nothing. So everybody is pulling more water out. If you know, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, intense agriculture in the last 50 years. Um, if um, the Palestinian Authority and all of the uh, governing structure of Palestine just capitulated <coughs> and the one state <coughs> became a reality, would the way the water uh, distribution uh, change or would it be a really powerful uh, tool to emphasize the apartheid. Well, okay, a couple of questions. Bridget asked uh, if the Palestinian Authority were to capitulate. That was my option for it. And, um, and it became one state. Actually, I'd separate those. The, the one state would be where, on purpose, all the inhabitants, the political wills, and everybody said, okay, this ain't working. Let's, let's combine our assets. So in that one state solution, and our question was, then what would happen? Would it be an equitable distribution or more severe? But in, in a real one state solution, it would be an actual democratic system wherein the water goes where it's needed, and uh, the, you know the, that would be the ideal. Um, but the but, way but, the system set up. Well, the way the system set up, sure. But but the other question is, if, if indeed the Palestinian Authority capitulated, then that option would not be a one state solution. It would be Israeli, Israeli. Okay, that would be an opposed one-state solution, but but it'd still be an occupied territory which would be governed by the rules of war. The, the Fourth Geneva Convention dictates how you manage the uh, assets and resources of the conquered territory. It it doesn't mean you have to enhance it. You know, you could leave it in a terribly degraded state and say, okay, it's yours. So so. I don't like that option that much, but at least it would call the bluff of this so-called uh, pretend nation of Palestine. So, but let me let me put the best uh, look at your question. Say, what would a once a true one-state solution be? Yeah, there'd be a legacy of terrible infrastructure here and better infrastructure there, but still, there's not much water. The main problem is not really enough water to do this right. But if all the water in Israel and Palestine were distributed equitably, it'd be a lot better. Now that, that it would be, but you know, look at look at South Africa. Um, <clears throat> Twenty-five years ago, people said if it all became one nation, there would be blood running in the streets. Well, I spend three months a year in and around South Africa, and uh, in paradise, um, I'd still rather be a, a white person there than a, the average white person is better off than the average black person. There. So you know, it's not it's not it's not superb. But it is inching toward doing it right. And so um, the cultural gap between the, in, between the Palestinians and the Israelis is not nearly as broad as the cultural gap between the African blacks and, and the European whites, who have been, uh, un, you know, that, that power structure has been in place since the 1600s. Um, the situation we have now in, in the Middle East has been in place for less than 100 years. So, and, and the cultural differences are. Well. So, you know, it seems to me a higher, higher prospects for success. Sir? Uh, point out on the trickle of the Jordan, the Israelis built uh, resorts on the banks of the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is 
sinking and the beach is going away and the hotels have to run shuttle buses to see the water. Yeah, the gentleman just quite emphasized the shrinking of the Dead Sea. The same thing on the Jordan side, that, that the water is going down and people who used to have water somewhere near the water's edge. Um, and and you know, the Israelis are doing a good job of mining out the mud and stuff for use in, in cosmetics. And things. Susan, I think, I think this lady Carol, you've had a hand. Yes, it's just a semantic question. The, you talked about the gas, uh, the gas fields yes. outside yes. Gaza. Are they for petroleum or are they? Are Natural they gas. Natural gas. Yes. I mean, presumably, you know, maybe uh, liquid petroleum is there too, yeah. but but natural gas in abundance Thank is there. And, and reasonably enough, you know, resources don't pop up on some line drawn on a map. There, there, there are similar resources uh, north of the Sinai in Egypt and other places off the coast of the Israeli coast and in Lebanon. There are, you know, it's not not uniquely there, but that seems to be the biggest. That the biggest field, and this, by the way, is this was is what these natural gas deposits were discovered in uh, 99, 2000. Directly after that, Israel started reeling in. There's a 200 uh, kilometer natural normal territory of limit. Thank you. I'm getting a five minute countdown. Thank you. Uh, normal is I think it's a 200 kilometer territorial limit, 120 miles. Um, Immediately after this uh, resource was discovered, Israel started modern, maintaining a much tighter uh, control over the Palestinians, which means the um, fishing, uh, the deep, the deep sea fishing couldn't happen. All that's left is artisanal uh, fishing in small boats that can go up one, two, three kilometers, and they get shot at. The Israelis sink and shoot and harass uh, any, any Gaza fishermen who go up to go up more than a couple of kilometers. Well, the shallow water is polluted, contaminated, cracked up, because there's, there's no sewage treatment. But they can't go out to where the fish are, because if indeed they started doing that, then the Israelis are afraid they might feel entitled to actually. And it's part of that disenfranchising uh, of, of the people from their assets. Yeah. Is, is the um, desalinization project still in effect? The, the, the lady's asking about desalinization. Uh, the Israelis have desal advanced. I worked in 2003 as part of a proposal, a bid proposal team to, uh, was, my company is one of three who were the finalists to propose on a USAID funded desalination plant at the Gaza City. And the funding was USAID and uh, they decided to not advance that. I think they were just afraid it might actually improve a lot of the Palestinian people. So instead, the project that did go forward is the one I was on, which is this pipeline, which is, exists. This is empty pipe that go north south through Gaza to distribute no water. It's a political symbol. Yeah. Well, well, I'm, I'm interested in the desalinization too because if their system was so great over there, they'd be using it. But here they're coming to the U.S. and selling their desalinization things for the water. Gee, I understand. They're wanting deep water here in New Mexico. I'm a water activist working on community rights ordinances. Uh, we're working statewide with the CELDF that's uh, working on rights of nature in Bolivia and Ecuador and such. But they're here in New Mexico. Well, so they get their hands on the deep water. The question is about, about the Israeli the companies, companies, right? companies who are skilled in desalination being present here. Well, yeah. yeah. And in any. So, what's there? What, what is it they want? Are they here to sell these desalination technology, or are they here to, use the, to be here under the guise of that, and what they really want is New Mexico's deep water? Well, I, I, I don't know. You know she's talking about is really for But the main thing is, if, you have a, if you're a product, desalination or light bulbs or anything, and if you're good at it, you want to sell it in other countries. So, I mean, it makes sense that they would be here selling stuff. But also, there's an issue of privatizing of water, and it could be there are foreign companies interested in a piece of that private well, The state thing. says that they don't have jurisdiction over it, therefore the counties in New Mexico need to, to take jurisdiction. Because I would say Israel doesn't have the rights to the water in New Mexico. Well, let's, if you and I talk about that afterwards. Yeah. It is t it's time for everybody to I think open the doors and let's go off. And, 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 and,